yeah a very good morning to all of you hope my uh, audio is clear to everyone yeah it's clear okay perfect uh yeah so today we'll be having today and tomorrow we will be basically having a a webinar on understanding about big data oh, sorry mongodb and um uh, about myself uh, so this is silvia and um, uh, i do have around 10 years of experience in the industry and for the last 4 to 5 years i've been into uh, the training sector uh, wherein i do take uh, trainings on data warehouse based technologies and big data uh, all the eco components associated with big data uh, as well as mongodb uh, sql and python so these are the technologies which falls under my forte and all these areas i do take uh, sessions to um, so that's a small introduction about myself and uh, we do have around 20 i believe 20 participants today yeah so that's great to start so shall we start yeah let me bring in my slide yeah so before we even start i uh, would like to hear from you um have you heard this term mongodb or if not specifically mongodb have you heard the term no sql somewhere on um uh, uh, the industry that you have been working on or if in case you are studying you're just a fresher have you heard this term anywhere yeah um what do you think it could be to store unstructured data okay i started getting answers already that's a great thing uh somebody is saying to store unstructured data okay harsha that's right uh yeah any other answers non-relational database that's again great a very good answer from Aishwarya. Yeah, anybody else? Any other point of view? Store data that do not follow any schema. Okay, great. That's from Arvin Siris. Stored as a key value pair. Okay, again, that's another uh, perfect answer from Nitin. I think most of you have some idea then, right? Because I could find out all the answers are pretty much related to what we are going to talk about today. Yes, Nimish Chain. It's non tabular database. Okay. So, uh, and a small request from my side uh, you are most welcome to unmute yourself and ask questions in between the sessions if you have. Uh, but considering the number of people that we do have, uh, it would be great if you can. Uh, keep yourself muted and when needed you can go ahead and unmute yourself so uh, so that we can avoid extra background noises uh, during the sessions so okay fine that's great and um, uh, you can also uh, go ahead and put your questions on the chat sessions as well okay fine now, simply what is NoSQL? And I'll take all of your answers. Almost all are perfect, uh, which is like, it could be a non-tabular database. So, or stored as a key value pair, anything that doesn't undergo any schema. But I also know there are few people who don't have any idea on all of these that have been shared by people here. So for that reason, I would like to bring it from the start. Now, most of you will definitely have idea on SQL databases, right? Uh, in fact, few of you would have worked on some or the other um, uh, SQL based databases, right? Now, whatever you have studied on SQL, if you just quickly rewind all of them, uh, you can easily understand one common thing irrespective of all the RDBMS that you have uh, studied, like whether you would have been working on an Oracle or a, no or a MySQL or a PLSQL or a Teradata or DB2, any of these RDBMS, if you happen to work with, uh, uh, you can basically find something that is common, right? Which is the data that I'm trying to keep, where in a table of fashion. 
correct like the data that it is going to store contains some proper structure running on it like for example let's take an orders table then the order table will be having details like order number order name uh, what is a product that has been purchased under that particular order who is the user who made the order now all these fields are predefined right so if i want to enter a value enter an, uh, inside an order table i must have values for all this if not it will be replaced with null right so these are some very basic understanding or very basic observation that you could see in all the rdbms across right now when i go into these kind of uh, sql databases the thing that has been bounded to me is i can't go beyond the structure right suppose i am interested in storing some graphical data or if i am interested in storing some textual information which can be dynamically changing then in those case these sql databases doesn't help me right now in such kind of environments and such kind of situations we can get into no sql database and also when you are not aware on what kind of data it is going to come now when it comes to sql databases for example as i said an a simple order table you know if there is an entry comes in it will have only these five or six columns right but imagine you are working on an environment where the data keeps on changing now sometimes you will be getting three fields sometimes you will be getting extra some few fields and sometimes you will not be getting them now these are some of the challenges that you will see and we are seeing right now in the industry uh, wherein the data becomes much more demanding right previously the data was not demanding it falls under a criteria it falls under a structure but nowadays in all this digital era wherein uh, we everything and anything becomes data right uh, it demands uh, a lot of uh, requirements so simply saying the data becomes more demanding and we need to um, suffice all this uh, we need to provide some solutions such that all these demands are met and that is the way uh, no skill has been brought into the industry um, now you if you can think of they are non tabular databases right uh, in the sense you don't have to fix your data or hold your data in a predefined structure it can be very well dynamic which we are going to see uh, and specifically the no sql database that we are going to see today is basically called mongo database or mongo db in short table of data is yes. right so clear on that part any uh, any clarifications needed on why we need an uh, no sql database and why sql cannot serve some of these challenges that we have discussed perfect uh now as i said so uh, suppose imagine um uh, i am getting uh, an order from uh, i am working for a retail based client uh, and i do get orders regularly in every day so there is a point of sales data that comes to me and i will read them and i will store them so so far uh, i am doing good i am keeping an sql for my storage as well as for my processing and i am doing great but the challenge is going forward Uh, maybe i made my whole stuffs into online my whole sales becomes completely into online and on demand and um, the data falls in becomes different it comes under different categories and since people started demanding products in all kind of uh, categories and all kind of um, classifications um, the data also becomes that okay the data abides by that right so i find sql is not fitting for me anymore then i need to go ahead and understand okay what is no sql uh, what are the stuffs no sql can offer me so that i can make a decision okay whether i can go ahead to no sql or is there any other uh, technology that can help me so in order to understand that we have to um, uh, get some basic idea behind uh, the no sql databases right so here are some of the observations that i have provided um, which we can see right now and then uh, we'll go ahead and understand each one of them in a detailed way right uh, so the first point is basically here the data has to be structured compulsorily the data has to be structured uh, wherein when you get into a no sql database it's not that case 
right not necessarily it has to be structure now there is a predefined schema running on it like as i said now when i'm having an order based table and i have defined them in a way like i have some five columns say order id order name okay the products that have been purchased the amount on which that has been purchased uh, username location few other details so the schema is predefined now here i'm giving you a biggest benefit of dynamically defined schema so you can have as many columns in a particular row and in a row you can have only two and again in an another row you can have 50 columns also and not necessarily the column should be of same data type it can be completely of different and they can be completely holding a different name also right so completely flexible uh, to say flexible at its best okay now the third point um the first two points we have discussed before itself so you can understand them easily so the third point is basically you will organize first and then collect the data later in the sense as i said uh, you will be having a schema defined right so that is what organize first refers to so i set a schema and after the schema has been defined i'm going to store the data inside so based on the schema only i'll collect the data right that is what your sql falls under but then here since i don't have to abide by the schema because i can change the schema at any point of time you collect the data first let the data be in whatever order it is or uh, let the data be in whatever format it is uh, absolutely not a point of concern so you collect the data and then based on the data we can organize it okay is that point clear this is one of the critical difference between uh, sql databases and no sql databases the reason why we have to focus uh, on the collection of data first is because data can be dynamic right it can be of any uh, schema or any pattern so don't worry about the schema initially just focus on the data get your data based on the structure of your data if needed we can go ahead and change it change the schema of your table after collection how and where so those steps will see so there are different types of no sql databases right so the one as you said uh, as we have uh, uh, seen before uh, there are different types and one of the uh, uh, no sql db that we are going to uh, cover is mongo uh, so i will show you how these data will be prepped we'll see in the lab as well uh on how these data can be prepped how initially it can be collected and how it can be uh, stored later just hold on to it for some some time harsha will cover on that okay great now the next point is vertically scalable um have anybody heard about this term or uh, in fact a simple concept of scaling what do you think scaling actually uh, means <clears throat> measurement increasing record something about the ability to add exactly right something about the ability to add more in a database um uh not exactly arranging kavya shri uh, so it is basically like see i'll i'll give a very simple example uh initially i'm working with an uh, 1 tb machine okay let's imagine i'm i'm working on with an uh, 1 tb sized machine right now um uh, based on the work that i'm doing i could find that 1 tb is not enough for me i might be need, uh, i might be in need of a 5t a machine 5t hd then what i'll do i'll scale it up i'll go ahead and change the hard disk capacity of my machine either it can be extending the uh, inbuilt hard disk or i'll add some uh, i mean external hard disk whatever it is but then what we are basically trying to do i'm scaling up my machine right i'm giving some extra memory for my machine which is simply called scaling 
and like um, as uh, Den uh, ES have correctly mentioned, something about the ability to do with having more data inside our database. Right. This, yeah, very simply put upgrade, as uh, Shushmita has rightly said, to be very simple and specific, it is just an upgradation. Right. Now, you can upgrade such stuff or you can scale uh, any of this database in two different ways. So one is vertically scaling them and another one is horizontally scaling them. And again, I believe most of you know this. Now, if not, what is vertically scaling is changing one individual machine's configuration. Like I'm changing the RAM capacity of my machine or I'm changing the hard disk space of my machine. That is like uh, specifically with respect to one single mission is basically called vertical scale. Now, suppose imagine I'm working on a cluster kind of approach, right? Wherein I do have multiple machines connected to each other, or I'm working on a server based approach wherein I do have multiple servers connected to each other. Now, I'm not interested in scaling one single machine. Rather, what I want to do, I'm going to adopt multiple other machines inside my cluster. So that is basically called horizontally scale, right? Now, when it comes to SQL, vertical scaling works at its best. Actually, we have a topic called scaling and the difference between vertical and horizontal scaling. Uh, mostly it will be covered today by the end of a session. So uh, that time you will have, have a very detailed understanding on these two concepts. But right now understand that when it comes to no SQL, it can work on both vertical and horizontal scaling, but horizontal scaling gives much more benefit compared to vertical scaling in NoSQL database. Now, how and why we can do that? Uh, yeah, we will cover all of them towards the end of uh, uh, this day's session. Okay, fine. And the last difference is legacy. You have been using it for so long. Right. Uh, I remember um, when I was doing my college, uh, even that time we have studied RDBMS. Right. So it's been there for a pretty longer period. Most of you would have worked in among all the participants that we have uh, around. We have around 29 people with us. Uh, I'm very sure that somewhere or the other in your career journey you would have worked with this skill. So it has been there for a pretty longer period. Uh, and because of its existence for a longer duration, a lot of support has been uh, given for that, right? And no skill has been upcoming. Uh, uh, max to a decade it is there, but then it's kind of getting its popularity in recent times. Um, and that is a reason um, people are still not completely confident in switching over to NoSQL databases for their requirements. But yes, uh, going forward, we can definitely see the growth of NoSQL to be really high. If not to an extent of SQL, but definitely it will, it will reach its own place uh, in the upcoming years. Okay, are we clear? Uh, do we have any questions here? Perfect. Now let's move on and understand with a simple example. Let's spend a good amount of time on this slide uh, because uh, let's understand uh, the differences uh, between how a same data can be handled in SQL and no SQL. Uh, now I'm going to be specifically talking about MongoDB here, uh, but we do have multiple other column oriented uh, 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 no SQL databases, key value pair no SQL databases. But today, let's only talk about MongoDB, considering the time that we have. And uh, MongoDB is one of the document oriented no SQL database. So now let's understand uh, how a simple data uh, can be stored in SQL and the same can be stored in no SQL. Okay. Now, if you see on the left hand side, uh, you can find an SQL database. <clears throat> now, the table looks very simple, 
right? I have fields like employee ID, employee name, uh, whose experience. Uh, we'll come to that, Nimish, just uh, hold on for that. Uh, we'll talk about, uh, we do have different types of NoSQL databases. We'll talk about that as you see in this slide. Uh, but right now we'll have a look on the data first because I believe uh, having an idea on this and then moving forward into that part of theory really helps in a better understanding uh, instead of dumping a lot of theory and then coming into it. So let's, let's cover this and then we'll see on uh, the different types. Okay, and what each type means. Fine, let's take this simple uh, example. Now, as you see, we have fields like ID, name, experience, address, and domain. Uh, and as you all know, uh, in address, uh, I might be having a requirement to store uh, something like uh, the apartment number or the flat number or the door number, whatever it is, uh, depending upon where the employee is residing. His details like his street, uh, his city, his country, his PIN code. Right now, inside a column, I cannot store all this detail. So basically, what I will create, I will create a unique number under the employee address, and with that address, I'm going to create an another table. Right. So whenever there is a matching employee address between these two, then I can identify that this person, say Kishore, belongs to Bangalore and India, and he hasn't provided any pin code for his entry. Uh, this is basically a, an SQL table it cannot have multiple values inside one single column. It should hold atomicity, first n of normal form, right? All those stories comes here. So for that reason, what we are basically doing is I can't keep all the values inside one single column. So I'm basically keeping one number and that number as a key on an extended table there I can provide all my details. So if at all I need to know um, the entire information of Kishore, what I'll do? Any idea how I, if I need to know his complete details, the domain also I need to know the city, the country where he belongs to, then what we will do in SQL side? Joints. Simple joints, right? You can go ahead and do a very simple join such that I will get his entire details. Exactly. Exactly right. All of you are right. A simple join I'll do so that I can get this entire information. Now let's take that same scenario and let's come into how the thing will be handled in a NoSQL. So by doing this, you will understand okay how uh, uh, or in what terms these NoSQL databases are beneficial for us. Now in a NoSQL database, especially in a NoSQL database like Mongo. we will be storing the data in a format of a key and a value pair. Your data can be of anything, right? Data could be of anything of any format, but MongoDB will store it only in the pattern of key and a value pair. And the key will be again a, a string or it could be of anything and there will be an associated value for that particular key. And the value can further be decomposed into again a key value pair, or it can be only a collection like list or an array, or it can be even a very single value also. Right. Now let's see how it can be done. So to give you an idea of key and value, I have written here as an ID and value. Now I'm going to take this employee ID as a unique value, right? Because uh, practically speaking also, uh, if you're working in an organization, you will be having a unique ID. Uh, no two people will uh, 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 will share the same ID, right? So for that reason, I'm going to pick this as a unique value that is going to help me extract a record. And how the entire data will be stored, it will be stored in the format of a key value pair. And that needs to be enclosed inside curly brackets. So now within curly brackets is where you will be keeping your data always. That's a must, okay? So that's the first rule behind it. And after that, you will be having your keys and values. What are all the keys? As you simply can see here and relate, your column names or your field names is basically going to act as keys. 
and the value that you're going to keep inside that column that becomes a value for this particular key and compulsorily there has to be a colon which is separating your key and your value right and another point is the field should always be enclosed inside double quotes or the keys should always be enclosed inside double quotes these are some very simple and uh, uh, basic stuffs that you need to know when you start writing records inside your mongodb now see the value if you can uh, if you can see how these are related can you observe like employee name okay i have got a value i have given it experience again yeah i have employee address instead of giving one single value i am basically specifying his number which could be again a door number or an apartment number whatever it is and the city he belong to and the country and most importantly if you have observed there is no pin code right have you observed there is no pin code here now why there is no pin code the simple thing is in your sql database whether a particular row is having a value a valid value or not there must be an entry inside it at least a null will be there right if not a specific value of pin code comes on there there will be a null value which will occupy for this particular row on the associated call and this also becomes a problem so if you deeper dive uh, into if you go deep dive into your sql databases will will have this concept of uh, sparsity of the databases wherein the more number of null is there in a table <clears throat> that can likely affect the <clears throat> performance of your table all those logics are there, right but when it comes to mongo if at all you find a field and it is having null value in it ideally i'll not be having that entry at all now this simply shows how it has been dynamically storing the data now whenever there is a value yeah i will provide that value whenever there is an uh, whenever there is no appropriate value coming there is no point in keeping the field at all so when there is no pin code it simply means there is no value coming up for this particular id set well and again employee id retail so do we have any need for doing join here absolutely no need because i have given the entire information inside my one single record itself so certainly it's a benefit for me now we imagine there is one more id now let's say there is another employee id say 13 or 14 who comes in and he is having few extra columns like what is a project that he is working on and what are the technologies that he is working on now these fields they are not needed for a person say 12 but they are needed to be stored for a person say 13 then definitely you can add his value so looks like we can operate only with a country name because no sql holds to operate with kind of unstructured yes we don't need it exactly right so it's not like we don't need any additional records sometimes your employee id if they have provided a pin then definitely for that entry the pin will be there now in this particular sample that i have taken there is no value and that's the reason i have not provided now that's why i said if suppose there is another person called 13 right now imagine there is another entry called 13 uh, let's say priya okay and we have 10 and some number and let's say banking now for this person um Uh, again it comes down to employee address some value now somebody is providing a pin code let's say some 10010 now if i try to insert this particular value here then definitely pin will come along with all the values that you are seeing here pin will come right because there is a valid value associated there so we are not going to convert an sql data into a no sql data but the reason why i am showing this difference is because most of us have some good idea on sql and hence you can come you do a comparative study and understand what will be the plus here uh, when i try to store a similar kind of data in a no sql database 
Uh, am I clear? Perfect. Perfect. Great. So now let's move forward and understand. Yeah, one more point here. I was in the middle of that, but then I took that question. So when we were having few extra fields, now suppose, for example, on the SQL table, as I said, uh, uh, like I have some few records being inserted before in the employee. Uh, now your clients are coming and saying, no, it would be good if we have added a column called project uh, and the technologies the employees are working on. What is the procedure to add columns in an SQL table? What are the steps that we need to take care of? <clears throat> Alta and do you think it is as simple as just directly going and altering the table? Will it be much easy, like how we do an select or an um, uh, an subquery or a group by or whatever manipulations that you are doing? It's not the same as alter, right? Why alter command is much costly, and can we directly go ahead and anybody can directly go ahead and do an alter on the table? See, alter commands are always costly and they are high privileged commands. Unlike exactly right, as Harsha has mentioned. Now I can go ahead and alter, but then again, when you're in your training medium or when you're using on your one single machine, it's perfectly fine. But imagine you're working on a, a scenario like uh, in a distributed approach, your data has been stored, then it is not as easy as it sounds. You have to get a request, you have to send a request to your DBA and DBA has to see the data. They have to approve. And even after that, as he said, after you're altering, we need to take care about the existing records. What will happen for those existing records on this updation? So now what will be the uh, project? What will be the technologies used for those entries? Right, I have to go ahead and update them. Now that is the reason it is much costly operation. Okay, but when it comes to NoSQL, you don't have to worry about all those because here the biggest advantage for me is I can have as many columns needed at any particular point of time. And there is no worry about, do I have to update those fields for the existing records? Absolutely no, because every individual record is different here. Right? Yeah. Now, having said that, let's talk about the categories of NoSQL. Now, on a higher level, NoSQL databases basically gets divided into these four, okay? So these are the classifications under your NoSQL. So uh, uh, there are a few uh, databases which we basically refer as document-oriented under NoSQL. Uh, and the one that we are going to study now, which is our Mongo, falls under this document database category. Uh, now, what do you mean by this document? Simple. Uh, whatever we call as table on your SQL, right? Like a table is nothing but a collection of rows, right? The similar to that uh, table terminology we have here called collections. So now going forward, you should not be using the word table, rather you have to use a word called collections. And how we refer rows in your SQL, here we are going to refer them as documents. So basically in NoSQL, a collection is nothing but a set of documents or multiple documents together constitute one single doc, one single collection. Now, some of the examples of document-oriented databases are Mongo um, DocumentDB from Amazon. Uh, and the good part is both are open source. Uh, and both have their community and the enterprise edition as well. Uh, and as you know, the difference between them in all other uh, frameworks. So community edition comes with a lesser features, but again, it's completely open source. Uh, you can go ahead and put your hands there and understand how all this processing happens. So the same comes with their uh, amazing document database as well, wherein both works in the concept of key value pairs, uh, like, like I have shown here, right? 
the previous slide, how it has been uh, stored uh, uh, in a pattern of key value. The same uh, uh, type is what your Mongo as well as your document DB is going to be stored. And when it comes to Mongo, uh, the source can either be a CSV file or it can be a JSON file. Okay, uh, have you guys tried uh, uh, or have you heard about JSON files or use them somewhere? Because CSV, I know most of you would have used it somewhere or the other. Yeah, exactly. Then it is great, okay. JavaScript, okay, okay. If you have used them in Python, then it is absolutely like you will have a very good understanding. Now, such kind of JSON files or CSV files are the ones that I can convert it into a Mongo collection. And the same applies with your, no problem. Even if you don't know, we are going to uh, uh, see how a JSON file will look like. In fact, we will build some JSON files also. So if you don't know, no problem, I'll cover it anyways. So that is with respect to the document database. So see, I have given you just two samples. There are a lot of document-oriented databases. Uh, just to give you some uh, view on uh, these databases and some samples under them, I have provided uh, just two with respect to every type. Um, and uh, one more point that would be of helpful that would be of helpful to you uh, with respect to um, other document databases is uh, they will uh, store the data at the backend in the format of JSON files, which internally will be converted into BSON files. BSON is nothing but the binary format of your JSON files. We'll talk about that again. We'll talk about, yeah, yeah, correct, okay. So BSON is basically a binary format of the JSON and why we need to convert a JSON file into its binary format because binary supports a lot of uh, advantages for us starting from the space, the different data types that it offers in all those contexts. And hence, uh, uh, you have to convert the JSON into BSON uh, when it gets loaded at the back end. We'll see that how, we, how to convert, how they get converted, what are all the benefits of BSON will come. Now coming to key value based database. Now here also it is going to be a key and a value, but here every key will have a pointer associated with the value to which it is basically pointing to. Uh, and it will be stored in the cache here uh, when it comes to key value database. Uh, so the key and the corresponding value will be stored under in a cache. And hence the retrieval, if you see compared to documented oriented database, key value database provide a higher retrieval. Uh, that is, there's a good speed uh, when it compared when it compared to the data that has been stored in document and key value. But the moment when I say it's going to be cache, you should also understand that it comes at a great price, right? Not compared to uh, your Mongo or uh, Amazon, but here since cash gets involved, uh, it's going to be of a little costly, uh, though the performance is going to be really good. Uh, the storage and everything comes under great price. And column oriented databases are basically something wherein the data again can be structured here as well, but it will store the data in the format of columns. Now, what do we mean by columns here is, I'll just give a very high level view because we are not going to study that now. Uh, it will be something like this. So initially I will have column one and column two and within the column two, I can have, so I'll have this as, mm, uh, let me have this as an employee name an employee address. So address is my second column. Now within this column, I can have sub columns also. So the number, the city, country, street, whatever you want, you can keep it inside. So basically we call it as a column family. Uh, and C2 is one of the column family uh, with its header to be address. And within that we have the actual columns called number, city, country, and 
state. So the memory is going to be stored in the format of columns, and that's why it is basically a column-oriented type. Uh, HBase is again uh, one of the commonly used column-oriented and Cassandra as well. Uh, HBase can be tightly coupled with your big data environments, uh, especially with your Hadoop, uh, and Cassandra can also be integrated, uh, but then that is an individual part comes from an organization wherein HBase comes from the same organization from where you get uh, your Hadoop, which is from Apache, right? So the, the basis behind the column oriented databases, the data will only be stored in the pattern of columns and sub columns also. So together we uh, refer them as column families. Uh, and again, here also they follow the master slave approach and all those. And the last one, which is kind of getting its popularity in recent times, I should say, uh, is called graph-based approach. Because so far, whatever we are seeing is mostly with respect to the data. Now, when it comes to Neo4j or DJ, uh, or D, sorry, DG, which is uh, dgraph, uh, it is mostly about storing the data in a fluid-based approach. Uh, and it can be used a lot in um, network exploration uh, and optimization areas. Okay, so wherein they will be uh, storing the data in the format of um, edges, nodes, and how these nodes are basically interconnected to each other. Uh, if you see the picture of Neo4j itself, you can relate. So these are basically the data, individual data, and how these data are linked to each other. So the linking. Okay, so now these uh, nodes uh, will basically have uh, some relationship between them. Uh, does somebody need uh, the live transcription? May I know who's that? Yeah, Shima. Go ahead. Okay, so it stores, yeah, exactly. As Dan said, uh, you can store them in the format of, yeah, yeah, guys, you can, okay. Yeah, so it is basically going to store the data in the format of uh, pictures, wherein it will be having nodes and uh, the edges. The edges are basically the connections between the nodes and the properties that it is uh, going to uh, connect these nodes with each other. So some of the examples of graph-based structures, do you guys think of any graph-based data that you can see around, that you can access day to day? graph-based storage. Think of, I, I bet you will be definitely using. Exactly, right? See, most of you have some idea. Social media, specifically, uh, I can say LinkedIn, but most of the social media platforms, maps, yeah, right? That's it. So that's one of the graph-based databases. Though we don't have a lot of applications been running right now under the graph base, they are very limited. Uh, but um, the thing is we are sensing that going forward, we will be having a lot of graph-based stored applications. So yeah, so that is again a higher, uh, that is a popularity that's going to be generated for them. Now, since we have covered a little bit about the different types, I know we haven't covered extremely well because we don't, we have some shortage with respect to time, but we will be covering detailed stuffs about this specific database called Mongo. So, but before I step in, uh, do we have any questions? Uh, 
or can we proceed? Okay. Comparison. Uh, yeah, comparison between SQL and no SQL based on the speed. See, definitely when it comes to speed, that is a good uh, there is a good ratio of speed that you can see with respect to no SQL. You can understand that by seeing the data that we have stored here as well, right? Uh, uh, the join part, right? Now, right now, since you have some idea on SQL, you will be knowing about the performance as well as the time taken if in case I need to join multiple tables. Now, what I'm claiming on no SQL is you don't need to get into any joining of that sorts because when whatever columns are needed, you can enclose them. So it is basically the terminology that we use here is called self-contained collections. In the sense, every data that a particular collection needs, we are going to keep them inside one single collection itself. So obviously, the need for join has been very much reduced when you step inside a NoSQL. Agree? Uh, I won't say in, uh, in a general way, Harsha, uh, but before that, uh, can you understand my question now? Like, do you think Will there be a need in, uh, right, that's what I'm talking about. So definitely there is a good speed, but that cannot be generalized. It purely depends upon what nature the data that we are going to deal with. See, in sometimes it is always good to get bounded by a structure. Can you agree? Now, especially in industry-based projects, sometimes it is always good to be bounded with respect to a structure, depending upon what business that I work with. I can't expect a random data to pop in inside my DB. I always expect the data to be defined inside a structure. Now, in that cases, I don't have a second thought to move into NoSQL. And that is one of the biggest reason why NoSQL is not gaining a huge popularity from the time that it has been launched till now. Because even now we do have some of the projects, as I said, they demand the data to be only in a defined way. But if you open the door and if you are welcoming data of any kind of type, and if you compare a speed race, then I can say, yes, there is definitely a higher hand from your no SQL. And that's why I say, I'm not generalizing it here. Depending upon the data and the requirement that we have, yeah. Is that clear, Hasha? Okay. No problem. Fine. Now let's talk about um, a few of the points. As you could see, I have uh, marked them down. Uh, so first and foremost, um, it is written in C++. Am I going too fast here? If, if so, please stop me because the main motive here is to make you, because it is just a webinar. So we just want to make you get uh, an understanding on this. Uh, so if in case I'm going at a higher pace, please stop me and let me know. Okay, perfect, fine. So it is written in C++. Okay, the, the language on which it is basically built is in C++ and uh, it is an open source uh, and is one of the leading NoSQL databases. Um, or uh, I don't know whether I have said this term before. NoSQL can also be uh, called as not only SQL, right? In the sense, not only meant for structured data can be uh, used for unstructured data. So some people do say that's, uh, I could find that term in MongoDB's website, but not in multiple other places. Uh, but yeah, it can be taken into consideration to not only SQ. Now it is a cross platform in the sense can be installed on a Windows based or on a Linux based or any other operating 
or on a Mac, depending upon uh, what is the OS that you're currently uh, using. And it is a document oriented, which provides a higher performance, high availability and easy scalability. Now, you should also understand the fact that uh, MongoDB can be installed on a standalone machine or on a cluster as well. And the good news is uh, MongoDB from the website itself, they offer the cluster support too. So they have a Mongo cloud called Mongo Atlas within which we can hire missions and we can have a cluster setup built in that. I'll try to show it either today or tomorrow towards the end. Uh, I'll show you how you can build it up and uh, you can practice on that. And it works on the concept of collections and documents, multiple documents together being stored inside a collection and you can have n number of collections in your Mongo. And MongoDB simply stores the records in an organized way, but not the legacy way of rows and columns. Now, this can be contradictory to many because we have been saying uh, there is no schema, then why I'm saying it is in an organized way. Now, when I'm saying an organized way, what I mean is the structure it holds. I'm not defining the nature of data here, right? I'm just defining the way that you're going to store it. So it should be definitely in a key value pair. You can either load it from a CSV or from a JSON file, irrespective of that, it will be stored in the format of keys and values. And that is what we refer here by organized way, but not the legacy way of rows and columns wherein strictly uh, column should be of certain data type and row should follow certain logic. No, you don't have those constraints here. Now, all data in MongoDB will be stored in the format of a JSON or BSON documents. And every row can have its own unique structure, right? And by which it has been completely referred as in dynamically structured data. So we don't create any boundaries here. It is depending upon every individual record it goes. Yeah, Devanshu, you have any questions? Okay. Now, uh, let me go to the official website. Okay. Uh, so, if you click over here, it will take you to their official page. Okay. Let me close all this stuff. Okay. Now, this is your uh, uh, download page wherein you can go ahead and download. Uh, I have provided the link here, but I will also be sharing you the link on the chat box. Uh, if in case any of you are interested to uh, work in the lab, you can go ahead and do it. It's a quite simple installation process, but then uh, I would recommend not to do it parallelly now during the session, do it. Maybe you can do it after the session because it takes a little longer steps uh, and we need to provide details over there. By any chance, if you have MongoDB been installed before, great. If not, you can. Uh, now, this is a page wherein we can go into the community edition. Okay, the link that I have shared. Now here you could see the version, which is 6.0. 6 is the latest version, uh, the current version. Uh, and depending upon what is your OS, go ahead and pick it up. And uh, depending upon the OS, you can change your package extension too, and you can download. Okay. Now, once you download, that will basically bring you the community edition of your, the one that I'm providing here, the link that I'm providing here is for community edition. If you want to go ahead and download an enterprise edition, yeah, you can go ahead and do that as well. But since we are uh, in the training sector, I'm just giving you a community edition, which comes to you at free of cost. Okay. This is one thing. 
and uh, with this community edition itself we are good to go but then i also want you to learn something called tools mongodb tools now uh, i'll give you first some idea about this mongodb tools and then probably uh, i'll uh, show you the page and what is the extra benefit that you can do and again i'm saying you you don't need this db 100% to work with mongo but this is also going to help you to understand few uh, details now what do we mean by this db tools now uh, the biggest usage of mongo db can be seen very well in environments like big data uh, wherein um, i have to read the data from a mongo db and process or i process a data on my big data cluster and store them back inside mongodb now irrespective of these two cases um, i have to use my programming language and from the programming language i will perform some logic the result of my programming language i want to store inside mongo or the other way around from my python or from my scala i will be writing a mongo command which will basically help me to extract the data from my mongodb and then bring it into the big data environment do whatever processing i want and if needed you can again push them back into mongodb also now if you have any one of these requirements then you certainly need this mongodb too. especially or or to be simply put integration now integration with any of the other programming languages or from any scripts then definitely we need this db now if you feel no i i right now i don't want to do any of the integration i just want to learn it individually as a stand alone tool then you don't need these db tools as such just with the community edition we are good to go okay i'm just explaining this because uh, you should not be thinking that why i have to do both so it is Uh, depending on you if you have a need for that uh, go ahead and download so i'm clicking on this link as well this link also i will be providing you on the chat uh we don't have an online mongo db as such but as i said we have a mongo cloud harsha i'll show that as well but when you open a mongo cloud from the uh, the cloud itself will open and mongo compass for you it will open a shell for you uh, from there you can practice your mongo commands but if you are planning to seriously learn this i would recommend to have it been load, downloaded inside your machine or if you go completely on cloud then it's a different scenario but uh, i would highly recommend if you ask me i would recommend to download it practice all sorts of operations and then you can scale it up at any day to cloud online mongodb as such like it's not like an online sql editor that we have for different sqls but we do have the one coming up from mongo itself called mongo cloud there you can practice okay fine now see this is mongodb tools as you can see Uh, it's been mentioned as mongodb database tools uh, and here uh, you will be having the 100th version uh, select again the os and click on download okay now uh, it will again generate a list of bin files those bin files you have to keep it inside your main community folder bin file and then we are good to go now once you finish that visit uh, it will basically open a compass so this is called mongo compass okay this is called mongo compass um and the moment you finish your installation uh, this is how it will basically look like just give me a second yeah so this is how it will basically look like and um uh this is a graphical editor for all your mongodb based um uh, exercises uh like how we do have ids for different programming languages and the same way we do have <clears throat> this as in gui so now the moment it gets opened it will show you an uri 
okay now this uri basically tell you from where you are configuring your mongo now as i said i have configured it inside my machine and that's why it is coming it as local host and what is the port number on which it is running this is the default port number when it comes to mongo like how we have um, uh, we have 3306 uh, as the default port number for mysql the similar way we have this. so every db will have its own or uh, uh, default port number right so the same way here it is now since we have configured our community edition this link you will be getting and after that you have to just simply click on connect and that's it your installation with respect to the gui is done now you could see my queries now uh, the one that you could see on the left hand side right these are my different databases now within every database i will have or i can have lot of collections now within every collection i will have some documents can you see the documents been coming up on the right hand side these are the different documents we'll see on how to load and all those so just don't worry i'm just giving you an idea of how this gui uh, looks and what are the things that you have to be aware of so the one on the left hand side is basically a simple tree structure uh, that will tell you what is a db name what is a collection name and the records inside the collections comes here okay fine now the next thing is how it is going to basically store the data. I will show you on how to uh, import the data and and create a create your very first MongoDB collection. And also, while you do that, you can either load it from a file or you can load it directly by inserting values inside your Mongo collection. Uh, like the way that we insert records inside your tables, right? Inside your uh, database tables. How we do that? Insert into. Ah, yeah, you can perform analytics very well. You can perform. It's not only a storage place, Harsha. You can very well perform analytics. There are a lot of APIs that comes along with. Uh, uh, there are a lot of apis okay application programming interfaces uh, there are a lot of apis that comes along with mongo through which we can very well perform analytics okay fine <clears throat> in fact you can visually represent the data also you can go ahead and uh, visually convert your MongoDB collection uh, into different charts, different graphs, pie charts, and all those, and you can have a look on it. Great. Fine. Now let's come to this transcription. Also. Okay. Fine. Now, how it basically stores it. Okay. Before I, I move ahead and show you how you can first load the data inside your Mongo collection. Now, how the data should ideally look like, if, especially if it is in the format of a JSON, okay? Now, this is how a sample you could see. Again, a curly bracket. I can have a column name and I have a value associated. Again, a column name, value, value. Can you see something like this? This is again called as an embedded document. These are little advanced uh, JSON documents you can have multiple documents inside one single document right like as you see within this we have address and within address we have again different values so let's have a quick a quick look on uh, the rules that we have so you have to start and end with a curly bracket see there is one more curly bracket which is for this one so each key and value should be separated by a colon and each key value pair will be separated by a comma. 
this is especially for people who haven't seen JSON before or who don't have any idea on how a JSON file will look like. This is the structure of a JSON. Uh, and these are the rules that you have to follow when you are building a JSON. Okay. Now, there are a lot of websites who can give you JSON files. Have you guys tried kegel.com? I do take some of my documents from there, some of my sample files for, especially for trainings from there. Yeah. So if you want to work with some JSON, but you don't want to build them now uh, by typing it, please go to the site. I want, I will type it. You, you can get all kind of files there, Harsha, not just CSV. You can get you can get JSON, you can get TSV, CSV, simple text files. I mean, I would say it's a very good website, especially if you are uh, 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 learning something, and if you are in a need of. There were days people do data wrangling to get records. Now things become much simple, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For anything you can see, this is a website from where we can download files. Ah, that is what I'm saying, Harsha. You can download uh, JSON files also. You can download all type of files. So have a look on them. Uh, it's a very interesting website where people, and you can also go ahead and upload if you have a good file with you. Fine. Now the keys can also be referred as fields, uh, like how we technically call them as columns in your SQL. It can also be referred as fields. And you may also have sub document inside documents at times, like the one that you could see here. And you can also have an array of values for a key that I haven't showed here as an example. Now, suppose uh, imagine there is a field called projects. Okay. You can keep all the bunch of projects that you have worked with. A, B, C, whatever you have worked with. So a value can also be a collection or a value can also be again a nested document as well. Okay. Fine. Now we have been talking about this B and right? Uh, I told you um now whatever data that i'm keeping will be in the format of json but internally they get stored in the in the format of bson or binary json files to be simply called now uh, you might be wondering why we need to again convert why can't json itself serves the purpose agreed now i can convert a simple json file and convert it into a collection okay in in your standalone machine fine it is completely your machine, the memory, everything is there from your single machine. It's perfectly fine. You know your maximum capacity within which you can play around. But imagine you are working on a cluster based Mongo, cloud Mongo, right? Or working on servers, wherein the data comes at a cost, right? The storage comes at a cost. Now, if, you, if I want to make the best out of storage, then Mongo is and that is the reason Mongo is asking you always to convert your JSON file into its binary format so that the storage can be done efficiently and effectively. And it not only gives you an efficiency in terms of storage, it also gives you wider variety of data types to be stored, which your JSON cannot provide. Okay. Just have a quick read here. This can help you to understand. Now, it mainly bridges the gaps between a binary representation of data and the JSON. Now, as you see the JSON here, you can read it. They are in human readable format. So you can very well uh, have a read and understand uh, what is this data talking to you. But when I convert this data into a bin format and store, of course, it is not human readable. It becomes machine readable format. And that is the reason. And that is the reason why you, are, why you are getting a good performance when it comes to storage. Not only about storage, right? The flexibility. Now, how flexibility comes here? Because BSN handle different data types compared to JSON. 
And here, textual data can only be stored within an UTF-8 format, wherein here it can be stored in a binary format. In the sense, I can handle huge storage of textual information efficiently in your BC. And here it is human readable, there it is machine readable. Since it is machine readable, the efficiency in terms of reading and writing them back will be much higher. So at a higher level, what you need to understand here is the data that you're going to provide will be JSON to you. But over the network, when they get stored over the network, it will be in a BSON format. But when you open it, again, it gets converted at the back end and it will be displayed to you only in the format of JSON. Internally over the network, it will be stored in the format of BSON just for a higher performance. Okay, now uh, you don't have to go so detailed and understand about BSON right now because these are with respect to the way in how it it gets stored at the back end. But if you uh, want to try them out, uh, you can click on this link. I have given their official link for understanding the differences about BSON and JSON. It's a very, very good document uh, coming from the maker itself, like coming from the MongoDB website itself. So you can 100% rely on its data. Uh, so any, B, any JSON data that I have provided, this is how it will store at the back in the format of BSON. Okay, uh, I have provided it in my slide. So if you want, you can uh, take down my slide and you can refer all this stuffs. Okay, fine. Now let's quickly go ahead and do some simple loading stuff, right? Now, how I can build it. Okay, one more thing before we proceed. Mongo is also offering you a shell here. Can you see the bottom down? Uh, can you see a greater than symbol and Mongo SH? This is nothing but Mongo shell. This is one of the latest features starting from 6.0. So now here you can go ahead and type uh, your uh, shell based commands. Now, if you have downloaded and Mongo and installed on it, you can directly open the shell from your command prompt also. So simply you have to type after your installation is done, you have to type Mongo SH and it will um, start the shell for you. So this is from your command prompt, whereas this is the shell from your compass itself. Okay. Now how you can practice commands. So there are multiple other databases that are available here. Now, as you see, I'm writing a command called show DBS, which stands for show databases. So these are the different databases that I do have within this instance of Mongo. Okay, now I'm going to do any one of the I'm going to select any one of the DB. You can write use. These are statements similar to your SQL, right? Can you guys relate? If you have worked with any of the RDBMS, you know this, right? Use database, the same thing. So now I have been switched to the training database. Now, Show tables is the command that we do in your DB. Now it is show collections. Can you see these are the bunch of collect? You can expand this if you want. So these are the bunch of collections that I do have under my DB called training. Similarly, we do have multiple other training, DB, uh, sorry, multiple other DBs as well. Okay. Or no, I am not comfortable in shell. Uh, if you feel no, I can I try them in compass? Yes, very well you can. But remember the fact, I would say this is one of the disadvantage also of Mongo. Maybe in future, these guys will come up with a solution for that. The thing is, um, the thing is, um, Without shell, I cannot completely work only with this GUI editor. So that is a challenge. Uh, 
because some people will not be much comfortable in working in CLI, right? People and especially <laughs> Uh, people who are working right now, they are always demanding GUI for everything, uh, graphical interfaces for everything. So gone are the days wherein we do only work with shell, right? Now, considering that fact, uh, this is a challenge because Compass can help you to read the data, but when it comes to updating the data or when it comes to um, um, deleting multiple data, uh, Compass cannot help you at its best. You have to come to the Mongo shell, but that's okay. That's let's park that aside for right now, uh, and let's see some basic operations. Difference between collection and document, Harsha. We have spoken about that, right? Yeah, Nivedita has mentioned. So whatever you refer as tables in DB, they are referred as collection here, and whatever we are referring as rows in your DB, here it is basically referred as document. I'll show you simply, see here. Now these are the DBs, databases. Now inside a database called check, I have these many collections, like some HPAC, IPL, student, sample, and all those. Now within these collections, right? If you select any one collection, can you see it's coming up like the DB name dot the collection, and within that, we do have the records. Now, these are records uh, uh, in the regular term, but when it comes to Mongo, you have to call them as documents. So all these are documents, and this is collections. Is that clear to everyone? So you should have a very clear understanding on what is collection what is i know it's new terms um, especially from people from a sql background it could be a little different in getting it or getting comfortable with that but yeah you will reach there okay fine now let's see on how to build a simple collection okay now i'll go to my training um, uh, one or let me show you a fresh car, a fresh uh, db okay now how you can create a fresh db go and click on the database section right there is a database can you see you can have to click over there and there will be a top left option called create database select that one and provide a database name so i'm creating something like learn by and within that i'm creating something like uh no let's provide a name let's provide a name called transactions okay now here i'm providing something called learn by webinar so learn by webinar is going to be my db name and the collection inside the db is going to be transactions clear yeah? click on create database now as you see you will be able to see the learn Bay webinar db newly been created now if you want to see what are all the collections inside currently i have only one collection which i have created just which is called transactions right now come to the right side of your pane now you could see there is a drop down called add data now you can add data into this uh, um, uh, into this particular collection, either in the format of file, or you can insert it document by document. Now we will see them through file because document by document, we are not using anywhere uh, in the industry because especially if you are working with huge sized files, you will definitely not do an insert by insert. Now, how you can understand that is, uh, uh, you, might, you, are, you have worked with some SQLs, right? you will not be writing insert into table name values and insert rather you will be loading them from a file the same thing applies here also okay so i'm clicking on the add data and or import a, a file or insert document or you can directly click on this place import data button both can be done now i'm going to choose it from here import file now here you have to select what is the file uh, which you want to convert it into a Mongo. 
collection and the file should be of either a json or it could be a csv now let me select so i have a file called the transactions okay this is one of a json file now i am going to use this file for my loading purpose so select json select the file go to the folder transactions okay now import now sometimes you will be having some errors on your json because if you are downloading it from some websites or if you are manually building some json because of some syntactical error now what we mean by that syntactical error is sometimes uh, the curly brackets might not be closed properly or the keys and values are not separated properly the comma is not kept properly now those are some of the things which will cause some errors on your json reading now if in case it happens here it will throw out an error if not the file is smooth then it will load you can click on done now can you see records inside this is a little uh, bigger file and a complex file but you can understand it very well right now just understand uh, what are all the fields that it hold okay i'll come to this array in a while but see what are all the fields it contains that is something called underscore id correct and there are some fields called account id it holds some number transaction count holds some number some two time stamps and there is an another field which is holding a data type called array now what that simply means a column can be consisting of an array of values also like as i said before right i have a column called project now within that project i will be having some array of values now if you deep down and if you want to make the data even more complex what you can do this array internally i can create it as a nested object also so for a i can create one nested object and for b i can create one nested object and for c i can create one more nested object for example within a i want to provide detail okay how many members are there in the project what are the technologies used in the project now where this project is located now like this if you want to provide then you will have a nested documents inside an array and that is what you are seeing here i mean I, i'll try to explain how you can read them or uh, a little later but right now understand that these kind of complex data can also be stored inside your mongo by any chance can we try this out in sql data of this pattern like this <clears throat> guys certainly not right how do you feel how do you feel the the structure and everything looks is it does it look complex see certainly no i cannot hold these kind of complex data inside my sql database because these are like documents within which arrays within which i gain nested documents like that i'll come to this underscore id which is a very very important point but let also try to load an another csv file because i just now showed only uh, loading a json file let me show you something on csv also do i have anything on csv okay i have one more let me show you on that so now i'm going to uh, convert a csv file select a file okay now something like this building file open and can you see the moment i have stored it is displaying me all the entries along with the headers by picking the default delimiter as comma now since it is a csv the separator is always comma now if you feel uh, no i have some other uh, separator then very well you can go ahead and choose 
can be either a comma or a tab or a semicolon or a space. Now, can you also see something here in the drop down option, the different data types that it can hold? Now, by default, everything will be string. And if you're comfortable on that, go ahead. But no, if you feel no, I want it to be an integer, then just go ahead and select. I'm just converting only these two to integers. The remaining all I want it to be stored in the format of string itself. Now click on import. Okay, it will take few, it's a very small file just with 20 records. So done. Okay. So now do a quick refresh. Okay, I haven't selected, created this. Okay, let me create a collection. I think I haven't created the collection. I just showed you the import. So create a collection, let's say building, right? Because that file was building. So go to building, go to import file, select CSV, select the file, select building.csv, click on open, import and then done. Okay, now can you see this is transactions file and this is our building file. Can you see the records been coming up? This is a very simple file wherein I have only key and value pair, no embedded document, no arrays or no collections. Uh, able to follow uh, friends, is it clear? Okay, I'm just loading, okay? I'm not doing anything else. I'm just simply loading the file into this particular table, fine. Now you could see all this records been coming up here. I have only 20 records and all those 20 records are coming. You can, uh, I mean, these are pretty self-explanatory. As you could see, there are 20 documents and by default, there will be only one index and that index is nothing but this underscore ID. I'll come to that, as I said, and total number of documents are 20. Now, if you're wondering, what is this underscore ID doing? Because you could find them been coming up on this file or on this collection also, on this collection also. And if you have observed something, I mean, even if you go to any of my other uh, collections, there also you could find this underscore ID. Now this underscore ID is just like, I think you can, uh, Ashima. You can check with the team. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Now, so what is this underscore ID? Now, tell me, tell me something about the PK that or primary key on your RDBMS. What is a primary key basically? what are or what is primary keys? Values which are unique, okay. Anything else? Keys used for connecting tables. A very interesting answer, yes. Only one primary key in the table. Again, a very good point, Sushmita. See, basically, can we say um, a primary key helps us to extract one unique row from a table uh, used to identify a record uniquely, right? If you feel there are some 50 columns inside your table, right? And I'm interested in extracting one row and I, it has to be unique. Now, multiple columns can have repeated values. Then how I can exactly identify one single record, that is where you will uh, you will come to your primary key column. Of course, all other of your answers are right. It could be the common column that can be used to connect multiple tables, extract uh, records uniquely and all those. Yeah. Now, the same PK concept comes to your MongoDB also by using this underscore ID. 
But the one difference is, can we have an SQL table without a primary key? Is it possible? Having an or building an SQL table without a primary key. Why not possible? It's possible, right, Nivedita? You can you can give it a try. You can whatever RDBMS you are working on, go ahead, build table. Don't create any column as a primary key. Primary key. It is still possible, right? So a table can be built with primary key or without primary key. See, primary key's main purpose is to extract unique record. Now, sometimes when you get data from your client, not necessarily there has to be a PK in it. You can create your own PK by, by doing an auto increment concept. You can have a column which will have a unique value later on. But then it is not mandate that you should always have a primary key in each and every table on your SQL. Yeah, we are not talking about normalization. I know you can't go by normalization and also, but, but the question is, is it possible to create? Very well, it is possible to create. Not necessarily you expect all of your tables to be normalized, right? So for that reason, yes, you can have, you can build tables without primary key, but when it comes to MongoDB, there has to be one column, which has to be always unique irrespective of what document you are trying to insert, there has to be always an unique column associated with every single document. And that is basically nothing but your underscore ID. Now, whether you provide an unique column from your source or you don't have any unique column from your source, MongoDB will create one for you. That is why if you have observed, say I will open this building file, uh, which I have users, which I have used to uh, load this. I cannot have any columns which will be considering as a primary key. See, this is building ID, but I cannot guarantee that it will not re repeat. Now, I just simply loaded this file and it creates a new column. It is not picking any column from the existing fields. Rather, it created a new column and it is calling it as an object ID and it stores some hexadecimal number with it. This is basically to uniquely identify a record. And this underscore ID is nothing but the index that you always see in every table. What is an index useful for? Have you heard the term index? Yeah, why it is useful for? Faster access. Right now, I can pick up any one column as my index column so that based on exactly right for it, it is basically to extract the re records really quicker. Like uh, simply saying a serial number in the list of entries that you have, or um, uh, or the page index number in the book that you are trying to read, right? So using that index, I'm going to extract the record really quicker. Now I'm having some 10,000 records inside my table. And if all this 10,000 records have an ID, and if I query for a particular index, easily I'll get it. Because based on the ID, index is generated, and ID is a unique value for all this 10,000 records. So I will get it quicker. Now suppose, imagine I have built index on a column, which will have repeated values. For example, I'm having 10,000 records, which is inside an employee table. And there is a field called a location, wherein these 10,000 people will be in any one of the five locations that I have. Like, like Bangalore. Okay, I'm, I'm talking about from India. So Bangalore, uh, Hyderabad, Mumbai, Chennai. Like this, we do have different locations within India. Okay, different cities within India. Now my people can belong to any one of these location. Now by any chance, if I pick my location as my index, then definitely the retrieval will be little slower because it's 10,000 people. 
because this 10,000 people will be splitted among these four locations and hence identifying them uniquely will become a challenge. Now, instead of keeping location as the index, if I keep my employee ID as the index and if I'm looking off for a particular person, then it will be extracted really quicker because every individual entry will have an unique ID associated. So obviously, Picking up index on employee ID is really good compared to picking up index on a location. Yeah, you can have as many indexes as you want. If you feel my operations are going to be based on the location as well as a particular employee, you can combine these two and create something called composite index multiple indexes. Like we do, you would have heard about this um, composite keys, right? Uh, two columns combining together and create one PK in MySQL, uh, the same concept. Fine. Now, this underscore ID, as I said, will be generated by your system itself. For every individual row, it will be individual document. It should be having a new value. See here the difference. It is 25, 26, 27 and goes on. Now, I have showed you right now how to build a collection by inserting file from two modes. One is through JSON and another one is through uh, CSV as well. Okay. So is there any um, uh, doubts on the loading part? Okay. Perfect. Now, yeah, these parts we have covered. Okay, I'll go to this theory a little later because uh, we'll cover a few of the um, lab parts today. And then maybe when we start tomorrow, we can start up with a few of the theory and then we can cover. Now, I'm interested in extracting uh, a record based on some logic. Now tell me before that, can I have two same IDs for two doc for two documents? Is it possible? 100% not possible, right? That you have to be clear on. But I will have two different uh, IDs, but all other values inside them are exactly same. Is that possible? These two values entirely same. Same building ID, same manager, same age, same country, but index ID is different. Is that possible? Exactly possible, right? See this picture. Yeah. See this picture. So if you see this picture, there are different indexes. These indexes are also referred to as an object IDs. And if you see in the picture, there are different names, 1A, 2B, 3C, whatever. But if you see the entire content, the entire content is exactly same, but still it is valid because you don't bother about the records inside. All you have to bother about the index. Now see on this case. Now here again, it is 1A, different values inside. This is also perfectly valid. Now both scenarios are valid until your IDs are different. The moment your IDs become changed, first of all, it will not let you inside. It will not let you insert that entry. And that time itself, it will be throwing out an error saying, there is no such possibility that you can insert this record. Records can be same, yes, exactly, exactly, Shushmita. Okay, fine, like this. Now, just have a look on some of the samples. Okay, now this is the one generated by your system, right? As you have seen in your compass itself, this is how the ID gets generated. And this is this is the one that is uh, created by your Mongo itself. And it is basically a 12 byte hexadecimal digit. Now, if you are saying, <coughs> okay, I know uh, every every document must have a unique object ID. If you have a question saying, see, I have a CSV file, okay, answer me this. If you have a CSV file, 
if you have an employee id with you and you are pretty much confident this id is going to be always unique then can you call this column as an underscore id what do you think exactly there is no maybe it is confirmly you can say it exactly you can define it so now when you are loading it if you are loading that particular column with the name as underscore id then your mongo will pick it up and it will consider that is going to be the unique underscore id field which is the index field for your mongo collection so don't think that always i have to go ahead with the machine built object id it depends upon if your file is coming up with an unique column on it go by that if you feel no i don't have an unique column inside my file then anyway system is going to be generated one for you but if you want to take it up from your file all you have to do is the column name that you are providing over here should be underscore id and hence it will be reading that as an underscore id otherwise it will create its own id so you have to specify that option fine now let's see about few other options here now you can view the records right now you are viewing this in this particular format i hope um, the one that i'm pointing is clear to you let me put it in this color yeah this is the one right now we are in now what will happen if i click click this curly bracket i'm right now in this mode it will be in a json pattern the same data will be viewed in the json pattern okay and if you go ahead and click on the third one the same data will be viewed in a format of a table so it's up to you whatever is comfortable for you you can go ahead and do it i kind of always go ahead with this uh, so i will be showing in this way but you can go ahead and do in whatever way is comfortable for you if you file like most of the people do say table is something that is comfortable for you, yes please go ahead and practice it in this system okay fine this is one thing and by any chance is there a way that i can export this data back into a csv file or a json file very well you can do it see right now we have only imported we haven't performed any uh, manipulation but imagine that you did some manipulations and you want that manipulated result to be stored inside a json or a csv file then can you see an icon here which is up arrow you have to select if you keep keep your cursor there it will report you saying export collection so you can keep your cursor over there and it will report saying export collection click over there it will tell you in two different uh, formats you can export one is export only based on what are all the details that you need you don't have to completely export everything but right now you cannot do this because i haven't explained you about filters once i come to filters you will you can understand how you can do this so right now go to the option of export full collection okay then click on select fields here also you have been given option saying whether you want all the fields to be exported or only a bunch then accordingly select okay and then click on select output now here you have to go and choose what is the export mode you want whether you want in a json or a csv now suppose if i want in a json because i have a csv file from where i have uh, loaded this right so if i want to export into json click on uh, json go to browse here you have to select the location where you want now suppose i am just selecting giving a name called building underscore webinar select and simply click on export now the export will be done and you can go ahead and click on show file it will show you where exactly your file is there and this is the exported file clear so these are some basics that you must know of course we will do some more exercises on filtering them out setting the indexes and all those but these are basics and you have to be very clear on importing and exporting okay fine now 
let's go to this transactions uh, or let me quickly load one more because there I do have a lot of data. So I'm going to take this kind of uh, data which is related to cricket. So it's basically a match that has happened and the data related to that they have stored. This is also data that I have collected from Kegel website only. Okay, click on import. Uh, there are some good number of records. Uh, 1,36,590 records. So you will be having a very good exposure to the data here. That is the reason I have picked this. Okay, so click on done. Now, can you see the records? It's a simple record. There are no complex uh, stuffs here. It is just a single key and a value pair. Now come to the main concept. Okay, wherein I'm going to um, check out for records which are satisfying some condition. So let's start with a very simple exercise. I am interested in finding when the bowler ID is 14, what are all the records which are there? So remember, see there are few points you have to remember here. You have to always stick with the syntax. If I mess up with the syntax here, it will throw out an error. So from there you can understand. Now, any conditions that you are specifying should be having this generalized syntax, which is key colon value. Now I'm looking out for records where the bowler ID is 14. Can you see the bowler ID field? It is having 14 and multiple other values also. Okay, so here I have a 15. Here I have again 15, right? But I'm not interested in all of them. All I want to know is bowler 14. Click on find. Now, okay, I'll do a refresh first. See, there are total number of 1,36,000 records, right? Now from there, I'm going to take only this condition and I'm interested in finding out how many records. So that out of 1,36,000, I have got only 2,500 records because only these 2,500 odd records are satisfying my condition of bowler ID 14. Clear? Clear friends? Quite simple, right? Very simple. Okay. Now, not the data inside it, the field names, however it looks, I have to specify in that way. In fact, you don't even have to type them Nivedita, by the way. You can just print the first word. Uh, it will automatically comes out. So you don't have to worry about the data inside it, uh, whether I have to give it exactly. In fact, you don't even have to type. Uh, uh, it will automatically pick it up. Okay. So as you see, I'm not typing. I'm just dropping them down. But then if you want to explicitly write it, for example, see, I'm if I'm doing it in shell, then I don't get this option, right? Getting it, if I, if I do it in shell, I have to manually type it. Then in that case, case matters. But then when it comes to compass, you don't have to worry on that. It will automatically pop out and uh, you don't have to type. Now let's take another case wherein I'm going to check out for, please do follow the syntax. What I'm writing is again the same bowler ID, but now I'm interested in finding out all the IDs which are greater than 15. Then there are some arithmetic operators, comparison operators and logical operators, which are there in Mongo, the same way that we have in your SQL. Now, you would have used them, right? These comparison operators on your SQL, not equal to and simply equal to. These are called comparison operators, right? 
in your SQL. Now the same how you have to use when it comes to your Mongo is dollar GT. GT stands for greater than. Similarly, dollar LT. LT stands for less than. Similarly, dollar GTE greater than equal to dollar LTE less than equal to dollar NE not equal to equal to directly you can specify with your colon like the last time I did right bowler ID equal to 14 the same way you can do uh, simple right not much complex to remember so just the first two letters So now what are all the records that I should get? I should basically be getting the records which are greater than 15. So let's run this. So click on find or you can simply hit enter also. Now out of that, see totally we have um, uh, 1,36,000, right? Now out of that, we do have got 1,35K records uh, satisfying. Uh, greater than five. Oh, I gave greater than five. Let's give greater than 15. Yeah, now you can see the count has been reduced. Okay, and also see the records. Can you see the 16, 16? Again, 16, 16. In 16 bowler ID itself, we do have lot. As you can see, there are 1,20 records. So certainly there is a good possibility of records been repeating right now here see there is a bowler id with 106 right here also 106 okay now i can change this like however i want now i change it to lt can you see the moment i type it gives you in drop down two options lt 15 bowler id 13 bowler id 13 and similarly I can do any, any stands for not equal to 15. So anything other than 15, it comes. Now, similarly, I can also do one more stuff like this. Let me show you. NIN operator. Any idea what this NIN will be? Yes. Uh, not in exactly right so the moment when i say not in i have to provide some bunch of values right so i'm saying bowler id not in 13 14 15 so everything other than these three bowler ids give me okay see i have around again 1,32k records so if you can go ahead and see a sample it is 16 which is obviously other than 13 14 15 right uh, now okay now uh, similarly the moment when i say nin is there you can also understand in operator is there so this will give you only 13 14 15. right fine now um how about I want to check for multiple condition. I'll stop after this, okay, because we're almost reaching time. Um, also, meantime, if you guys have any questions, please do bring in, okay, so that will not be, you can, you can send me the questions over the chat. Yeah, now how about combining multiple conditions, right? Like uh, we do have this logical operators and or, sorry, and nor or, right now these operators are also there in your mongo as well so how you can do simple go ahead delete all you can click on the reset button so that will clear out the result for you and give everything uh, uh, everything that has been displayed so now here i'm going to write um dollar and Okay, so when you are writing any of these logical based operators, you have to first specify them and then you have to specify the condition. So 
I am basically interested in finding bowler ID less than 15, comma, and the other condition. Uh, non striker ID. Okay, something like non striker ID, I want it to be two. Now, after this, close your bracket. See, the moment you, you make your syntax proper, can you see this red stuff goes out and it becomes gray, which means uh, uh, syntactically you are good, right? Now click on find. See, I could find only 84 records, which are satisfying both of this condition. That is their bowler ID is also less than 15 and their non-striker ID is two. Right? Fine. Now, the same way you can change this and to or. Now, when you do an or, it will basically tell you any one of these conditions can be satisfied. Okay, so here, luckily, both are satisfied. But see here, okay, non striker ID is not two, it is one. But still, Bowler ID is satisfied. The same way, the last one, which is nor you can try. No, neither or. This should also be not true. That should also be not true. Right? So these are some of the operators that you can try. We'll do few others also going forward. And we'll do some updates and deletes and manipulations as well. And also, as I said, using the DB tools, which is most important, We'll, uh, we'll do that as well. Okay, any questions please do bring in. Uh, so please do carry on the installation process so that before you come for tomorrow, uh, we'll be done with our, uh, you can uh, also try them out parallelly, some of the questions, uh, some of the operations that we are doing. So right now I will hand over to the LearnBay team so that, uh, They will be uh, giving you details about how all these courses are being organized from their side. Okay. Do we have Karishma here? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, Karishma. Uh, I'm done with my session. You can take it forward from here. Sure, ma'am. Sure. Thank you. Yeah.